thank you so much. It's such a great pleasure for me to, to be here and to share my thoughts uh, on what I believe is the role of donors in food systems transformation. Um, with just over eight years to 2030, I know everybody keeps talking about 10 years, you know, the last decade, but we really just have eight years. Uh, to when we should be achieving the SDGs. Um, the imperative and urgency to act has never been greater. And this is especially critical in light of mounting evidence of rising hunger and malnutrition. And, and Tristan, you've, you've alluded um, to some of this. And while we all know what the situation really looks like, um, one of the things that I would like to do before I start is share the most recent st statistics again so that we can all be on the same uh, page in terms of the context of the challenge that we are currently dealing with. I'm going to share um, a couple of, of, of slides um, to, illustrate, um, to illustrate this. Um, Tristan mentioned this, um, that over 811 million people, that's 10% of the world's population, are hungry. But sometimes it's often difficult for people to see this as, as, as not just numbers, but real people. So this is roughly the combined population of the Philippines, Russia, Nigeria, Mexico, Japan, Ethiopia or simply put the population of all of Europe. And worryingly, there has been a 20% increase in just one year. In addition, about 2.3 billion people are going without a number of meals per day. Essentially for every three people on earth, one of them is malnourished. And we should be really worried about this. The COVID pandemic has just made a bird situation uh, worse. And in most developing countries, which were already struggling to deliver decent lives for their people, this level of hunger has resulted in destitution, erosion of human dignity. There is no worse form of human indignity than hunger. And worse still, an increasing loss of hope for the future, and especially among young people. But failing food systems, we have to put this in context. They don't just mean that parents are struggling to feed their children, but a lot of them can no longer afford to even send them to school, which is the surest path out of the cycle of poverty, especially in rural areas. But we know this has not always been um, the case. And I know this for a fact because I grew up in a small village on the foothills of Mount Kenya just about 150 kilometers northeast of, of Nairobi. And those days, what I remember is our parents were able to feed and send us to school from the proceeds of their five acre piece of land on which all manner of crops grew from coffee to, to yams and maize and beans and, and vegetables. They had the right seeds at the right time. They had extension services available. The local market, worked. And thanks to that effort, my seven siblings and I obtained high quality education. Some of us moved to other sectors of the economy. Most of us are actually no longer directly relying on firms um, for survival. But unfortunately, not many have escaped this poverty trap. I go back home frequently. I work a lot in rural areas. I went back home a few weeks ago to see my father who's been unwell. And as usual, a chance to go home is also a chance to see my childhood friends. And I have a long time friend who still lives on the farm, Mama Dedes, as we call her now. She did not go beyond primary school. She now has seven children, grandchildren, all her children and their children are still relying on a small piece of land that is no longer productive enough um, for them. So land that used to be lush and productive is now constantly ravaged by, by drought. But even more importantly, it has been subdivided into small unproductive portions as population increases. 
So while the cocktail of challenges the world is facing, including climate change and population, are well acknowledged, what I believe and strongly believe is that stagnating and sliding back into poverty that we are seeing in most of our rural areas is inexcusable. So where do we go from, um, from here? Over the last 20 years, I have worked with rural women and girls in agriculture. I have worked in Africa. I have transversed most of Asia. And today I am probably for the first time filled with a lot of optimism that we are discussing the right issues um, through the global discussion that has been kicked off by the Food Systems Summit uh, that Tristan uh, mentioned earlier. While I'm still cautious in my optimism, uh, of course, I'm happy that we are no, long, no longer looking at food security and nutrition as an issue to be only dealt with by a Ministry of Agriculture, or by the few people that have been crazy enough like me to work in the agriculture sector for so many uh, for so many years. We are finally bringing food systems thinking and the global community into issues of food and, and hunger. And for me, this meeting is so critical because it is good to see donors as well coming together for a reflection like this on what their role in transforming food systems is. So when Maurizio uh, wrote to me, the organizers of the meeting, they gave me latitude to offer my honest reflections on what I think your role should be. And fortunately, I'm no longer in the donor world. I was in IDRC for seven years until last year. So if I say something that does not sit well, please, you have to look for Maurizio. He accepted to have his head on the, on the table if I say anything inappropriate. <laughs> but all this just aside, we all, not just you, the donors, have to have really honest conversations if our work is to make um, a difference. As a start of my reflection, I would like to commend those that were involved in the, in the production of the Ceres 2030 report, including my own institution, IFPRI. Because for the first time, we did have a blueprint to guide the way we channel investments um, and funds for meaningful impact, and especially to address food and nutrition insecurity, hunger, malnutrition. I would like to highlight just some key numbers that, that are in the report, just to remind us. So the report outlines 10 recommended interventions to end hunger to double the incomes of 545 million small-scale farmers and to limit agriculture emissions uh, in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. What the report also does is it gives us a breakdown of the required additional funding to make this happen. 330 billion US dollars up to 2030, 33 billion dollars a year. Some from donors, but also some from uh, middle income countries that they provide in addition to public um, spending. But the key question for me today is what should you as the donors do to actually ensure that this money, these dollars we are referring to actually deliver the desired results? First, I want to begin with the fact that um, while funding is critical, and, and, and we had a conversation earlier today uh, as the meeting was starting about funding. Sometimes it is not the foremost problem because if it is not appropriately channeled, it can also cause problems. So why do I say this? Because the truth is even with the kind of funding we have, we shouldn't be seeing the kind of spike in hunger and malnutrition that we are witnessing today given the funds already going into the sector. Through my work with governments, with private sector and with development partners over the past many years, I believe a redesign of donor funding approach must happen. Otherwise, any additional funding that we are calling for could potentially go to waste. So while I agree with the 10 recommendations of the Ceres 2030 report, I would like to propose three broad areas requiring radical change for donor funding to work. I am going to be a bit territorial here and use Africa to illustrate my thoughts. 
because that's where I am from. And after all, I think I can't get away with calling our spade a spade. So first, prioritization, prioritization, prioritization. Because every time I work across the region, you see dead, ineffective, moribund projects that deliver no real benefit to anyone other than those that they directly employ. The root cause of a lot of these failed projects is that they are never aligned to broad development plans and strategies of the countries that they are, where they are implemented. As most countries across the continent have competing priorities, we need to design investments in such a way that they go to top priorities, those that have the most impact on diverse populations. Now, these priorities have to be identified at the country level in close coordination and with full ownership of countries to ensure that they actually drive against the country's medium and long-term vision for the future. Prioritization also ensures that these funds are aligned with the country's capacities to absorb all the financial resources that are available to them. When resources are allocated to countries randomly, and I say randomly here very liberally, governments will most likely invest in areas that they can manage or that they have current capacity for. I live in Kenya, I am from Kenya. If you were to give us a couple hundred million US dollars today, we are most likely to channel those funds to probably to input subsidy programs. Yeah that are not always the most effective, or yet to another series of trainings for farmers whose outcomes we probably will never know. Now, this prioritization is actually very much along the lines of what the Ceres 2030 report has shown by breaking down where the $33 billion annually should go. The suggestion that I'm making today is that this kind of prioritization needs to happen at the country level. It needs ownership at the country level. And I do not want, and I'm in no way suggesting that governments have fully figured out what their own prioritizations are. It is one of the things that we are doing as one CGIR. And as if pre, we've been working with countries to support the development of these plans and priorities, applying a food systems approach, paying particular attention to the inclusion of the vulnerable and marginalized groups, including women and youth, and to include these groups in the planning and in the suggestions of what these priorities should be. And part of the donor funding, actually the start of the pipeline for donor funding should actually go to this kind of work. It is the starting point for change. The second thing I wanna talk about is making sure that funding reaches those who need it most. This to me is one of the areas that really require urgent uh, action. Existing funds are not always accessible to the groups that need them most. And I'll give a couple of examples. Type, typically, most donor funds go to projects with very little going to Africa's agribusiness sector, for example. And as my personal story going, growing up has shown, the relation whether these markets are national or they are regional. But they, these SMEs hardly uh, attract the kind of funding that they need. And interestingly, in the region, most of these SMEs are run by, uh, by women. We have seen funds meant for businesses being channeled through development finance institutions that are not designed for the needs of the producers or of SMEs or of women owned businesses. Most of these DFIs are looking for large businesses and deals to invest between $5 million, $10 million at a minimum. 
very few of these level of businesses in Africa are owned by women or owned by people in the continent. And neither do they have direct connection with the smallholder firmers that we are trying to, to reach. And incidentally, such small businesses do not even need $5 million. They do not even need $1 million. Sometimes they need half a million dollars or $100,000 to actually make the difference for the smallholder farmers they serve. And so my call is that investment funds should be redesigned to meet the needs of these businesses. In the long term, this will actually support much broader agendas like the African continent of free trade area. I'll give one quick example from, from India as well. Yeah. In India, a lot of women farmers are not recognized as bona fide farmers, but we know the roles that they play in food systems, right? They are regarded as wives or daughters of farmers. As a result, extension and investment programs are not always designed for them. And in, in instances like this, and I, I know the role of sending funds to universities because that's where a lot of innovations are coming from. But I also want to see some of those funds instead go to women's rights movements, women's organizations, women's cooperatives that are actually fighting for the recognition of women as farmers. The last thing I want to talk about as I close is coordination. Now, pick any country across Africa, and there are multiple players that are working in the sector. Most times these players are operating with minimal coordination and every effort should be made to ensure smooth coordination and accountability across government ministries, across development partners, across private sector entities, across the funders who are present in that country, across the implementing partners. Because this will not only ensure better delivery of results and accelerated development, but it will also minimize duplication of efforts and wastage. And we know that even in country where that such coordination happens, that progress um, is visible. Now, as I conclude, I want to say prosperity is possible. I would like again to once commend you for taking this bold step and to look at how best you can support food systems transformation. As donors, you have the ability to foster good behavior by channeling your funds into in initiatives that are transformational. We know now the level of hunger and malnutrition that we are grappling with is unacceptable. In a world that has made real, uh, you know, reality defying advances in sectors. In a world where we're taking people to the moon, others are sleeping hungry. It is totally unacceptable. So we know we cannot continue as if things are the same. And of all the food systems actors, you donors have the greatest ability to turbocharge action to address this runaway hunger and malnutrition. But we also know we cannot transform our food systems without investments that are based on evidence-based country priorities, without investing in small businesses, SMEs, without investing and directly investing in women and in young people. I thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. And I look forward to continued discussion and action on some of these issues that I raised.